morning we're going to continue on in our series of I Am a Superhero, part two. Uh, and looking at, there is a difference. There is a difference. In our theme, um, on the next slide, we can see our theme scripture is Jeremiah 29, 11, which some of you may even have memorized. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, to give you hope and a future. How many can say amen to that? Isn't that good? Maybe some of you are like, oh, hanging on on bare threads, but I'm going to hang on to that scripture. Amen? So again, we're going to look at, is there a difference between being a Christian and not? An interesting, interesting topic, but uh, it started this week. We were doing uh, devotions as a family, and I asked the kids that question. How do you know the difference between someone that's a Christian and someone that's not? Maybe you've never even thought of that before. Is there a difference? I'm going to look at the next slide. And there is a picture of Prince William and someone else. Can you tell the difference? between Prince William and just a common man. One has hair. Okay, good. But they look very similar, don't they? They both have suits on, both have ties, both good-looking men. Standing there posing, one sideways, one's face smiling, different smiles maybe, but look very similar. But the reality is they're two very different men, and serve two very different purposes. And so on the next slide, we see the point number one is there should be a difference with being a part of the kingdom of God and not. I'll say that again. There should be a difference with being a part of the kingdom of God and not. You know, it looks a little small this morning, but let's look at Matthew 7 and verse 15 to 20. It says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from bushes of figs, from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, neither can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. I'm going to repeat that last sentence. By their fruits, you will know them. So there should be a difference for being a part of the kingdom of God and not. I think so more so today than ever before. Because the world is becoming more and more corrupt. The problem is today, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. We have Christians that act just like the world. And thus the world says, what difference does it make? Is it just going to church on Sunday? I don't need that. I just stay home and sleep. It's my one day to sleep in. I work five, six days a week. So it's my one day to stay home and just sleep. What difference does it make? But there should be a difference. And we can see by that passage of Scripture, the Scripture says you will know them by their fruit. Well, what fruit are they talking about? Well, let's look at the next passage in a second. Did I not, can, can you go back one screen? Let's see. Did I not include Galatians 5? Maybe not. I'm sorry. Well, let's look at Galatians 5, 
verses 16 to 25. It says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with one another, so that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, fractions of envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh and the passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So I read for you two very different lists, did I not? The first list lists the things of the world. Sexual immorality, impurity, idolatry, hatred, fits of rage, dissensions, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. What does that mean? Etc., etc., etc. I think we could come up with a few words for today. Doesn't take us long, does it, to come up with words to describe the world. The second list describes the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, patience, kindness. Which words of those best describes you? You get angry often. You have hatred often. You have immorality in your life. Or does the second list describe you better? Would people say you are a person of love? Would people say you're a kind person? Would people say you're gentle? What would people say about you? Again, we read, they will know you by your fruits. Point number two on the next slide is the definition of Christian is Christ-like or follower of Christ. The definition of Christian is Christ-like or follower of Christ. So do I look like Christ? Am I doing the same things that Christ did? When the world looks at me, do they see Christ in me? All through Scripture, they would say, oh, I know you. You are a follower of Christ, right? We saw that with Peter. We saw that with Paul. On the day that Jesus was crucified on the cross, they said, you are a follower of Christ. How did they know that? Because Jesus' disciples looked and acted just like him. So much so that there was a difference. They could tell, mm, you're a follower, you're not. You're a follower, you're not. You're a follower, you're not. They could see the difference and spot out to say, arrest that person. That person is a follower of Christ. But with the same people today, be able to pick out the followers of Christ? Or are we all kind of blended in? John 10, verses 27 to 28 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, 
no one will snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that beautiful? God says, those are mine. Don't touch them. That's where MC Hammer got his lyrics from. Can't touch this. Ooh, ooh, ooh. sorry. No song of the day. But it's so true. We need to stand on that word. My sheep know my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So my question today is, are you following God? If Jesus was here right now in the flesh, if he followed you home every day, what would he say about your lifestyle? What would he say about your speech? What would he say about your friends? What would he say about how you live your life? Would it be the same? Or would he say, whoops? Hmm, that's different. Christ should not be following us. We should be following him. But in our day, our world teaches us to uh, make your own rules. Uh, it's okay to break those. That's so old, Pastor. No one follows that scripture. That scripture's outdated, needs to be revised. No. God commands us to be holy. His standards, not ours. And God's coming back for a pure and spotless bride. What's he going to see when he comes back? It's time that you and I rise up to be Christians, which is what? Christ-like. Let's look at the next slide. Obedience comes with a promise. Obedience comes with a promise. Let's look at the passage there, Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, step one, seek my face, step two, and turn from their wicked ways, step three, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. How many know that's a promise? But do you know it's a conditional promise? There's three steps. One, humble themselves. Two, pray. Well, three, seek his face. And four, turn from sin. But the promise is awesome. The promise is he forgives us and heal our land. How many people know we need God's healing? I'm just talking about sickness. Finances, too. There's no reason the church is broke. No reason at all. God's called us to be the head, not the tail. God's called us to lend to the world, not borrow. That's what the Word says. But you know what? I think there's more people in the church that are broke than outside the church. The world looks at us and says, I wouldn't want to be like them. They fight. They're broke. More marriages end in divorce. So I don't want that. But God is calling us to humble ourselves. Stop being so prideful. It's all about me. Pastor, they offended me. How can you be offended? Did you not, or were you not killed yourself, the flesh, and were reborn like Christ? So if so, our flesh is dead. Can't be offended. Is it easy? No. But we need to remind ourselves every day, my flesh is dead. 
doesn't mean we allow people to continue to hurt us. No. But the church gets way offended over the littlest things. And God is calling us to maturity. It's like little kid, children. My kids come all the time. Dad, Mike, I did this. Dad, Jaden did this. There's some days I just feel like saying, can you just grow up? You're 10 years old. You're 11 years old. It's time to just not worry about what other little people are doing. But you know we're the same. Pastor so-and-so told me this. Pastor, I'm the only one that showed up on Sunday. I'm the only one that helped. It's time that we grow up, church. Put away childish things. And be the people that God has called us to be. Because with obedience comes blessings. And the church is missing all the blessings because we're not obeying. So there is a purpose in being a Christian. It's time we pursue that. Think of the blessings that Prince William and Prince Charles have. Think of it. They get to live in the palace. They get a free house. Do they have to worry about money? All they have to say is, mm, I have a need. Okay, what's your need? Food? There's your food. Um, I'd like to buy a new car. Okay, there it is. Their king, or in this case, queen, supplies all of their need according to her riches, which is the whole kingdom, and glory, right? Likewise, you and I are part of the kingdom of God, which means everything he has now belongs to you and I. Imagine Prince William saying, oh, I wish I had food. I'm so hungry. What would people think? What's wrong with you? Just go down and eat. Your servants have prepared a whole table for you. Oh, I'm so hungry. And you know what? We sound like that to God. God, I'm so broke. I'm so hungry if you would only provide. God said, I have. But you need to listen to my voice and follow and be obedient. And when we obey God, he hears us and turns and helps us and heals our finances and heals our body and heals our land. But it's going to take a whole America to drop to our knees and say, God, I'm sorry from turning away from you. I'm sorry from just being a chameleon and blending in with the world and looking just like them. It's time that we rise up and be more concerned about obeying God than having the world be offended with us. Because you know what? They were offended with Jesus every single day. He didn't care. Sure, he was frustrated. Sure, some days he was overwhelmed to say, really? I'm healing the sick. I'm preaching some good stuff. I'm changing your world, and all you can think about is what I'm doing wrong? Really? Really? Did it affect him? No, he just kept going. And it's time that we rise up and stop thinking what the world's thinking and say, what is God thinking? What is God thinking of me? And if we don't know, all we have to do is pick up our Bible, dust it off. If you need a Bible, come talk to me. We have probably 200 Bibles in this church. A process of cleaning, we filled up cabinets full of Bibles. So please, come talk to me. I'd love to give away a Bible. We have tons here. If 
you don't know how to use it, great. Just come talk to me. We'll show you how to use it. But it's full of great wisdom. But again, it's time that we experience the blessing of God. It's time that we be like the prodigal son and say, I'm going home because my father's kitchen is full. Why am I eating from the pig's trough when my father's house is full? But it took him to step out of disobedience and return to his father and say, Father, I am sorry. I have sinned against you. Take me back. I'll be a slave. What does his father say? Put a crown on my son's head and a robe on his back. Because my son was gone and now he's back home. You see, the father doesn't care about we've, what we've done. All he cares about is you coming home. And it's time that we focus on the world and say, it's time that you come home. We need you in the house of God. But we do that by showing the world the difference of why we are Christians, not by our words but by our actions, by showing the world that we love differently. Mark Weber's been here probably three or four days this week, and he said, Pastor, I'm overwhelmed by the love that your church has shown me. You don't even know me. You've never met my son. And yet you've offered to do his funeral. You've offered your church for free. And your church is helping feed my family and friends so we can grieve the loss of our son. Wow. Church, that's what it is to be a Christian. To not sit there and think, oh, how much is this going to cost us? What is money for? Show the world love. And it's time, church, that we stop being like the world and start being like Jesus. He got on his feet, on his hands and feet, and washed the feet of everyone in the room. He did not sit on the throne and say, wash my feet. I'm a Christian. Look at me. May we look to the examples of Princess Diana. What was her name? Anybody remember? She was called was it the prin people's princess. Why? Because she served the people. She could have rode in chariots and Serve me. But she followed the example of Christ and just served people. And people looked at her and said, wow. She is the people's princess. Can the world call us the king's kids? What a name to be called the king's kids. Because the world so knows you that says, I know she's a follower of Christ. She's so different. We looked at last week with Superman and Clark Kent when his enemies were calling him all these names. And when the time arose, he didn't look at them and say, Pfft. You're my enemy. No. He jumped in the water and saved the very person that caused him harm. So obedience comes with a promise. Let's look at Malachi there. Chapter 3 and verse 6 through 12. I, the Lord, do not change. 
So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decree and have not kept them. You mind to take the word uh, descendants of Jacob and just say America. America, you have turned away from my decree and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. And you are under a curse, the whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouses that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see that I will throw open a floodgate of heaven and pour out such a blessing there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring the crops and the vines in the fields and will, and will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. And then the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. I know every time a pastor preaches on money, the ooh, church gets uncomfortable. But you know what? We are a church, not just a nonprofit. We don't take up collections. We take up tithes. For a true Christian knows everything I have belongs to God. It's not mine. I died at the cross, and I became a follower of Christ, which means I no longer belong to me, Incorporated. I belong to God, Incorporated. What does that mean? I'm just the treasurer. I'm, I pay his bills, not mine. And he says, the first bill I am to say is to return a tenth of everything he's given me to him. It's not up for me to decide. When we focus on what we're losing instead of focusing on what we get. We get to keep 90%, and when we're obedient, what does that scripture say? He says, test me in this. I will open up the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing on your life, you have to tell God to stop. How many would love that? How many would love to tell God, um, the bank's calling me and saying I have to open another bank account because there's too much money in my bank account? How many would love for us to stop that commercial of saying we need people to come and clean and say, oh, um, you all can go home now because we have so many people volunteering at the church. We don't know what to do with all these people. Everything in the church is fixed. And the whole church has come to every person in this, in this congregation's house and fixed everything that's broken with your house and fixed your cars and fixed your finances and fixed everything so everybody in the church is so blessed, there's nothing for us to fix. Notice it didn't say heal the church. It said heal what? Your land. So your act of obedience changes America. I look and say, oh, it's those wretched politicians. It's their fault. Eh. Whose fault is it? The church. If my people, not politicians, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and turn from their wicked. It doesn't say politicians turn from their wicked ways. It says my people. And I tell my kids, stop putting the blame on everyone else. Just say, Daddy, I'm sorry for what I did. Stop worrying about what everyone else is doing. 
But church, I don't know about you, but I need those promises. I need God to open up the windows in my life and pour out a blessing. But it starts with me obeying God's decree. Let's look at the next passage there. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. If you partially obey the Lord, is that what it says? No. It says, if you fully obey the Lord your God and recklessly follow, no, carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come to you and accompany you if you what? Obey the Lord your God. All right? So that's the condition. We obey God. You ready for the blessings? Let's look. You will be blessed in this city and blessed in the country. What does that mean? Wherever you go, your hands touch. God blesses you. How many need that? Let's look at number two. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, and your crops of the land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks. What does that mean? Your job is producing enough money to pay all your bills and still some. That means you don't have to work two, three, four jobs. No amen on that one? Number three, your basket and your kneading will be blessed. What you do with your hands will be blessed. You will be blessed coming in and blessed going out. In Peter's day, people would just wanted to be in his shadow. Because they were healed just in his shadow. Imagine that. And God wants you to be so blessed that people are hanging out with you because they want to learn from you how blessed you are. The Lord will grant that your enemies who rise up against you will be defeated right before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee you in seven. Does that not excite you? You've been praying and praying and praying for your, against your enemies for so long, saying, God, when will this end? He's giving you a path right there. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and everything you put in your hands to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. What? Things that you don't even have yet, God said, I'm going to bless you with. Those things you've been dreaming about. Some of you know Missy and I are looking for land that has water and, and trees and a place that we can have people over and be a blessing to. God hasn't given us to it yet. But you know what? I know he will. But it starts again with obeying his commandments. The Lord will establish you as a holy people and promise you an oath. If you can meet, keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him, then all the people of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will fear. Another word for fear there is respect you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity and the fruit of your womb and the young of your livestock and the crops of the ground and the land that he swore to your ancestors to give you. The Lord will open up the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, and send rain on your land in season and bless all the works of your hands. You will lend, not borrow, you will lend to many people. You will lend to many Nations, groups of people, because you're so blessed that you have room to bless others. 
No, again, I am not one of those prosperity preachers that name it and claim it and the name. No, that's not biblical. But God is saying, if you obey me, the consequences or blessings for being obedient is blessings. So when people ask you, why are you Christian? It is not to say to follow rules and regulations. It's say to be a part of the kingdom of God. And why would you not want to be a part of that? To be like Prince William, to not have to worry about provision, to not have to worry about it. Now, he does have a rule, doesn't he? He has a job to do, and he has to act like a king. You don't see the news report to him rolling around the gutter of the alley and being a drunk and this, that, and the other, do you? You see him acting like a king. Likewise, God is acting, asking us to act like sons and daughters of a king. So in closing, point number four, what areas are you missing the mark? What areas are you missing the mark? This is not meant to say, let's put it on the screen. Oh, look what she's doing wrong. It's how fast can I get rid of these things so I can get more blessings of God? How fast can I get rid of these things so I can get closer to God? I want to hear his voice louder. I want to feel his presence stronger in my life. And the faster I get rid of those things, the closer I get to God. I don't want anything in the way of my relationship with him. Nothing. But that means I need to be humble and say, can you help me with this? I'm really struggling with my finances. I'm not really good with paying my bills. Can you help me? I need help with my addiction. Can you help me? This area of my life is taking over my life and getting in the way of my relationship with God. Can you help me with being a parent? I'm really struggling. I'd like to be a better parent, so can you help me? Church, it's time to not just ignore the areas we're missing, but acknowledge them and go after help. Where does that help come from? Look around. That's what being a part of the family of God is. I promise you, there's people here who can help you. But it's time to say, I am a follower of Christ. And I will follow the things that Christ did. I will love. I will obey. I will serve. I will be patient. I will be kind. I will be a follower of Christ. And it's time for me to get rid of hatred. It is time for me to get rid of sexual immorality. It's time for me to get rid of all the things that are weighing me down. Poverty. So I can be a blessed person. Not for me to store up my kingdom, but have more to bless the world with. To bless the Mark Webbers of the world who are grieving and don't even have the money to bury their own son don't even have money to feed their family and friends as they grieve the loss of the loved one. Because I'm too selfish and have to build my second and third house and buy 14 and 15 cars. No. It's time we serve the world. It's in those moments in the Bible when Jesus blessed someone with something they didn't have that they knew he was the son of God, not by his words, but by his actions. May me too be followers of Christ. May we say, follow me as I follow Christ, church.